Bunbury, Episode 15, Foul Play. Written by Helena Marchmont, narrated by Nathaniel Parker. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Oscar Wilde Prologue Gloucestershire, April 1905 Sir Anthony Gray still missed Oscar, the wittiest, most outrageous and kindest of friends. It was five years since Oscar had died, but as Sir Anthony rode towards Hallwood, his Gloucestershire estate, what he remembered was their final meeting, a year before that. Poor boy, he murmured. Oscar had been poor in every sense, but Sir Anthony whisked him away from the shabby Parisian hotel to take the sea air at Trouville. And his friend had positively blossomed. He ignored the casino, he ignored the beach, he ignored the fashionable crowds on the promenade. Instead, he wrote and wrote and wrote. My dear fellow, he said to Sir Anthony, this is all thanks to your sparkling conversation. But Oscar, Sir Anthony protested, you've been locked away all day. I haven't said a word to you until now. Exactly. I can't tell you how grateful I am for you keeping your sparkling conversation to yourself. And one morning, as Sir Anthony was enjoying a coffee and a cheroot on the veranda, Oscar appeared, already dressed. Good gracious, I've never known you to rise so early, said Sir Anthony. Dear boy, I haven't yet gone to bed. I came to tell you that I've finished. It's a masterpiece. Oscar dropped a heavy bundle of paper onto the table beside Sir Anthony. The coffee spilled and the ashtray fell to the ground, but Sir Anthony ignored this. He hadn't seen Oscar so animated since his friend's self-imposed exile to France. He read the title page and blinked. Oscar, I thought you'd already written this. If something is a masterpiece, surely its value doubles if it's written twice, said Oscar and then laughed at Sir Anthony's uneasy expression. Fear not, my dear chap, I'm quite compus mentus. I didn't complete it last time. The charming Mrs. Leveson brought the manuscript to Paris for me to finish, but I left it in a cab, since the prospect bored me. But our excursion to the seaside rekindled my enthusiasm. I've created three new characters and transformed the plot. He signalled for a flunky in the drawing room to bring him a cup and poured himself a coffee. Sinking back into the cushioned wicker chair, he raised the cup to Sir Anthony. And you, my dear fellow, will take this manuscript home with you, and on my instruction, you will deliver it to my publisher. Sir Anthony leaned forward. Oscar, come back with me. You know you can stay at Hallwood. Take the manuscript to the publisher yourself. For a long moment, Oscar did not speak. Then, very quietly, he said, My dear old friend, I think that generosity is the essence of friendship, and you are generous to a fault. But no, I shall never return. He pushed the manuscript closer to Sir Anthony. There, now, the timing is of the utmost importance. I am in correspondence with the publisher on other work, and I shall wait until this can have their full attention. I rely on you to keep it away from prying eyes, and do nothing until you hear from me. But on returning to England, Sir Anthony never heard from his friend again. Now, as he rode round his estate, he wondered what he should do, given no sign of any instructions from beyond the grave. He had made sure that the manuscript was hidden away safely. 
but was it now time to take it to the publisher? Oscar had called it a masterpiece. Then it deserved to be made public, even posthumously. You entrusted your manuscript to me, old friend, he muttered. If you can no longer tell me when the time is right, it's down to me to make the decision, and I see no point in waiting. If your publisher doesn't want it, by God, I'll pay to have it published myself. With sudden determination, he spurred his horse into a gallop. He would retrieve the manuscript from its hiding place and go up to London with it tomorrow. There was a sudden movement in the undergrowth, a fox, perhaps, or a game bird. The startled horse reared and stumbled, and Sir Anthony was thrown to the ground. His final thought was that no one would now be able to find Oscar's manuscript. Gloucestershire, October 2022 Hallwood Hall All his research pointed to it being the place. But it was over a century since Sir Anthony Gray had died in a riding accident. If it existed, why had nobody found the manuscript? Had Sir Anthony lost it or destroyed it? Or might it be hidden in plain sight among the papers that grand families accumulated but took no interest in, leaving them to biographers and social historians? If he found it, he would no longer be regarded as a media tart. It would restore his reputation for generations. Unpublished play of Oscar Wilde's brought to light after a century by Professor Giles Webb. There would be radio and television interviews. He would write articles for the Times Literary Supplement, The New Yorker, The Paris Review. More than anything else in the world, he wanted to find the manuscript. Some people said they were prepared to die for the thing most important to them. Not him. He wanted to live and to spend the rest of his life basking in glory. But was he prepared to kill for it? That was another matter. Chapter One A Scottish Holiday Alfie followed his sister up the steep track, trying not to wheeze, or at least not audibly. Want to stop and take in the view? she asked. No, I'm fine, Alfie managed to say refusing to admit that he was having trouble in matching her stamina. Really, I, I think you should, she persisted. Honestly, I'm okay to keep going, said Alfie, uncomfortably aware that she was not only climbing much more easily than he was, but was also carrying a large rucksack. She had rejected his offer to carry it, telling him that she was used to it, always taking it with her when she went for a ramble in the hills. From time to time, he went for walks in the gentle Cotswold Hills near his home in Bunbury. These Scottish hills were different altogether, high, jagged, and precipitous. But he was determined not to appear feeble in front of Anne, or so far behind her as he struggled to keep pace. But she stopped and waited for him to catch up. This is quite a good view, she said. Secretly grateful, he stopped as well and looked back the way they had come. He caught his breath, which had nothing to do with the effort of climbing. Is that? It is, she said, grinning. He gazed down at the spectacular edifice, its granite walls sparkling silver in the sunlight. A gold flag emblazoned with a red lion rampant was fluttering from the high square clock tower. Banks of chimneys were dwarfed by the tiled turrets which decorated every corner. The castle was surrounded by woodland, and beyond it, he could glimpse the glistening blue of a river. Prince Albert bought the land for Queen Victoria, said Anne. They knocked down the building that was there and built Balmoral Castle. It's stunning, said Alfie. Now I understand why the royal family come here every summer. <laughs> Anne shrugged off the rucksack and unfastened it, pulling out a rug which she spread on the ground. Then she produced a vacuum flask and various containers, and a few moments later... Alfie was sitting, admiring the view, munching a sausage roll, a mug of coffee at his side. The climb had definitely been worth it. From this vantage point, he now saw the surrounding hills as majestic rather than intimidating, and he felt a warm glow of satisfaction at having climbed this high. I had no idea how beautiful it was here, he said. I've travelled all over the world, but I don't know my own country.